it's incredible in scope. You're going from one end of the Aleutian chain to the other and from one end of Alaska to another. The immense numbers of wildlife found throughout the Aleutians are often found nowhere else in the world. It's wild, the weather is rough, it can be stunningly beautiful and it can be very harsh and unforgiving. I really don't know any other place like it. There are a few places in the United States that are as untouched as the Aleutian Islands. There are places where humans truly are a visitor. Dappled throughout the United States are wondrous places, protected so that wildlife comes first, our national wildlife refuges. None is so vast or so remote as the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge. 2,500 islands, sea stacks and headlands, spanning almost 5,000 miles of Alaska coast, nearly to Siberia. The refuge islands are strikingly diverse, from ice-encrusted isles of the far north to lush, temperate rainforests of southeast Alaska, rugged rock spires, high bluffs, and smoking volcanoes. Volcanoes and earthquakes have shaped the Aleutians into a surreal landscape, where places still steam and vent sulfurous plumes. The peaks, craters, cliffs, and domes seen now are but the tips of undersea mountains. These peaks rose from the sea as heavy ocean crust, pushed down beneath the lighter continental shelf and forced upward its arc of volcanoes. Now, a scattering of distant, lonely islands. Ideal harbor for abundant wildlife. An extraordinary way to explore the refuge is to follow a season's journey of the Tekla, research vessel for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and see the refuge through the experience of the scientists who work there. The Tekla is a unique vessel that was designed for the refuge and built for the refuge and, and the refuge mission. We're 120 feet long, but uh, we've got a lot of ship packed into the 120 feet. Because of the uniqueness of the Alaska Maritime Refuge, some of the islands are not very well charted, so we have to improvise and we actually make our own charts as we go. We will travel approximately 20,000 nautical miles and be gone for approximately seven months this year. Tekla means eagle in the native Aleut language. The Tekla is a floating laboratory, a home away from home and lifeline to the refuge field camps for scientists from around the world. Leaving the security of the ship Biologists disembark to isolated, wild islands. Their mission, to study and restore wildlife. To monitor population cycles in species and be watchful of those at risk. To learn more about the habitats that support wildlife 
and to ensure that the biological diversity and abundance of the refuge endure. We get to see aboard the ship some of the harshest ocean conditions of any oceans in the world where the Pacific meets the Bering Sea along the Aleutian chain and creates some of the most violent waters in the world. We see winds gusting to 100 plus knots. We see sea and sea state conditions reaching 35 foot. And on a 120 foot vessel, they're ominous. Weather reports, which can change from hour to hour, might call for gale force winds, swirling fog, blizzards, and cyclonic storms. We're the only vessel for many, many miles, so you have to be very careful, and safety is the utmost concern when you're transiting these dangerous waters and these remote waters. Wildlife adapts to the weather and so do the scientists. Since the Maritime Refuge contains areas that are very isolated, and many of the areas are uh, in this zone where uh, weather is extreme. Our crews are isolated um, for the summer, May to September, in these various locations. So we take a lot of time to think about ways to improve their margins of safety. The islands and headlands are a spectacle of seabirds. More than 40 million seabirds of 30 different species nest on the refuge. Millions more visit here. There are more seabirds on the refuge than all the seabirds in the rest of North America. Just one colony on one island can be home to over one million birds and include 20 or more species. It's been said that sailors long ago listened for the clamor of bird calls to recognize headlands in the thick fog. It looks like a beehive. I mean, there's you know tens of thousands flying all over the place. It's just a, a loud place and a really uh, amazing concentration of birds in the air and on the water. Such vast numbers are a sign that the waters of the North Pacific and Bering Sea are a rich soup, thriving with fish and plankton to feed on. The Tekla is headed out to field camps and annual study sites, where refuge biologists monitor marine mammals and seabirds like the kittiwakes and murres on St. George in the Pribilov Islands. red leg kittiwakes are found throughout the Bering Sea and nowhere else in the world. Over 90% of the world's population nest on the Alaska Maritime Refuge. This is fortunate because the refuge can offer protection to this species. Reds and black-legged kittiwakes will nest in the same proximity to each other, often in clusters on the cliff faces. On St. George Island, refuge biologists work atop dramatic thousand-foot-high cliffs that hold multitudes of nesting birds. Murs are very colonial seabird. They nest in, in very dense numbers. Uh, they tend to come back to the uh, same site once they've nested year after year after year. They uh, keep the same mate. They only lay a single egg and, and raise a single chick in the, in the season. St. George is the largest mer colony in Alaska. There are probably two million mers nesting there in, in huge, huge numbers. Ledges that go on for miles that have uh, tens of thousands of mers on them. As the Tekla sails between islands, unexpected sights astonish even those with years of experience in the refuge. A 
all of a sudden all these birds appear and for the next 30 miles we see millions of shearwaters. The phenomenon of shearwaters coming all the way from New Zealand and Australia uh, where they breed. They literally form flocks that you can see on the ship's radar. And sometimes if you get into the big concentrations, you can basically see them almost all the way to the horizon. Far out the Aleutian chain is Kiska Island, where a field camp is summer home for scientists researching auklets. The display of auklets at Kiska is truly unbelievable. They come in in such incredible numbers, this mass of these huge ribbons of, of birds flying in from the horizon to over your head and beyond. They darken the sky and beats of their wings and their calls is kind of a, a deafening sound. It's really kind of a, a spectacle in some ways must have been like the passenger pigeons or the great herds of buffalo that are now gone. We have just the wildest guesses at, at populations in most cases. Some estimates run from the million to 15 million in a, one single location. The most abundant is the, the least auklet, and there are certainly millions and millions of those. Crested are the next most abundant. Crested auklets have this sort of tangerine odor about them, which is kind of overpowering at Kiska because the numbers are so vast. Parakeet and whiskered are probably the most unique. They nest uh, almost exclusively on, on refuge lands uh, in Alaska. In the islands of the Four Mountains, Chagulik rises ominously from the sea. There, U.S. Geological Survey biologists study one of the largest fulmar colonies in the world. There aren't any other species in our Alaska uh, seabird assemblage that are quite like fulmars, and you have to come to some pretty special places like Chagulik to have any chance to see them or to work with them. In this particular study, we're doing satellite telemetry and also uh, some genetic work that we'll do back in the lab. The purpose is to determine which fulmars are being caught in long-line fisheries. So that's very serious for a very long-lived species. These birds live for up to 40, 50 years, naturally. We're putting uh, satellite transmitters on the birds with harnesses. These are solar-powered units, which if we're lucky, we could get data for the next three years. We're pursuing it fairly aggressively because we get just crucial information that you know we've never had access to. Where do these birds go seasonally? Because that's a crucial management question. The vast ocean reaches that separate islands can also separate populations of the same species for countless generations. We have a number of unique subspecies. They're isolated so long that they're just different. For instance, I think we've got five or six different recognized subspecies of ptarmigan scattered along the Alaska Peninsula Islands and out through the Aleutians. The Aleutian green-winged teal, it's a uh, teal that's a lot like the North American green-winged teal, but it has as its habits that it nests on uh, scattered islands through the Aleutians, and that's the only place that it occurs. In Unamak Pass, the Tekla drops anchor at Iktak, where rich ocean waters support dense colonies of tufted puffins. Iktak provides nesting sites for a whole suite of marine animals. The most common bird is tufted puffin. We estimate about 100,000 nesting here at Iktak. And you might see thousands, maybe 10,000, swirling around over Iktak, and there might be thousands in the water right offshore at the same time, these big rafts floating around on the sea. Iktak is also home to the tufted puffin's cousin, the horned puffin, which nest in notches in the rocks.
On the Aleutian island of Yulak, highly trained researchers conduct a survey of burrow nesting birds, where they must employ the most obvious technique, gently reaching into the burrow to see what's living there. Like a Cassin's auklet, or a fork-tailed storm petrel. Storm petrels are also found on St. Lazaria Island in the southeastern reaches of the refuge, in habitat far different from the treeless tundra of the Aleutians. Storm petrels are burrow nesters, and they're able to survive here because the soil is loose enough for these tiny birds to be digging burrows into the soil. The storm petrel burrows are pretty tiny. We have two or three people who are looking for burrow entrances, and once they find one, they give it an individual number, and then they reach in to see if there's a storm petrel occupying that burrow. And if there is, then we note which species it is and if it might have an egg or a chick. Okay. It's only about a week old at the most. Yeah. One of the reasons for having burrows is so that they can avoid predators such as crows, eagles, peregrine falcons. They also return to the islands just at night to help avoid predation. We collect data during the night as well because that's when the adults are most active in returning to the island or going out to sea to feed. And what we're doing then is netting some of the birds in what's called a mist net. The bird will hit the net and then it slides down into this little pocket so that it's held gently. And then the researcher can go and remove the bird from the net and then collect the diet sample because these birds usually regurgitate their stomach contents. We collect diet samples so that we can see what prey is available to these birds out in the ocean and sampling to see what foods they're bringing back for their chicks. The Tekla is a floating field research site. Using hydroacoustic sonar, sampling and monitoring techniques, biologists study the marine food web. They discover critical feeding areas, sample the undersea food base, and record the changing ocean environment. Bogoslav. This active volcano was first seen as it rose from a fiery underwater eruption two centuries ago. Although a young island, seabirds and mammals moved in and multiplied to incredible densities. Until recently, when the sea lions mysteriously began to disappear from Bogoslav and throughout most of the refuge. Stellar sea lions have declined by about 80%, and that's happened in about the last 20 years. So they are now classified as an endangered species because of that serious population decline. There's a lot of research going on, and I think it's fair to say that there's not agreement on exactly what the cause of decline is at this point. The food base may be inadequate to, to have sustained populations, and that that is a factor. Uh, there's also um, some question about what the role of predation is by killer whales, uh, particularly on pups. Nevertheless, it's very clear that the population has declined and not gone somewhere else. As mysterious as the disappearance of sea lions is the appearance of fur seals on Bogoslav, even though they are declining elsewhere. When I first came here in 1973, everything you saw was stellar sea lions and not one fur seal. And now there are thousands of northern fur seals. I don't know whether it's the situation where the fur seals could move in after the sea lions decline or whether the environment just changed and that uh, now the fur seals have the advantage. The 
The sea otter population worldwide was nearly um, extirpated during the commercial fur harvest in the 1700s. With the uh, protection from the National Wildlife Refuge, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and the International Fur Seal Treaty, this population really flourished. So it's a very sh shocking result to find that in recent surveys beginning in the 1990s, the population for all of the Aleutian Islands has decreased by 70 percent. Simply the, the adults are disappearing. We need to understand what's going on in the whole system. What we're doing right now is continuing our monitoring effort and that, that's crucial to understanding whether the population is continuing to decline. It's crucial to understanding whether some areas are recovering or not. Sea otters are a very resilient animal and I think if we can keep their environment pristine, if we can keep um, enough of them around, they'll come back. It'll just take a little while. On hundreds of Aleutian Islands, scientists encounter evidence of Aleut villages and hunting camps. Their deep houses, called barabaras, were ingeniously designed with whalebone rafters. The Aleut, also called Anangan, have lived off the abundance of the sea and the land for 9,000 years. Today, only a few villages, like Atka, remain. Yet the Anangan culture continues, still relying on the island's vast natural resources, using their considerable knowledge of plants for food and medicine and the ways of animals and the natural world. Lured by the rich fur of sea otters and later fur seals, Russian explorers brought disease and oppression. Beginning with the voyage of Vitus Bering in 1741, Russians discovered the potential of riches in fur, and the world of the Aleuts would never be the same. The native people tried unsuccessfully to defeat their invaders. Instead, the Russians forced the Aleut to do their hunting. The Russians also brought foxes to be harvested for their fur setting them loose on islands that had no land predators. After the U.S. bought Alaska in 1867, fox farming and fur hunting took on a new zeal. Introduced foxes were devastating bird populations, and sea otters were hunted to near extinction. By the early 1900s, it was apparent that wildlife needed protection and the first pieces of the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge were established by President Teddy Roosevelt. Rusting away on refuge islands are the remains of what's been called the Forgotten War. Most people don't know that during World War II, the Aleutians played a strategic role in the Pacific. It was 1942. The Japanese bombed Dutch Harbor on Unalaska Island, killing 43 people. Then attacked and occupied the refuge islands of Kiska and Attu. To defeat Japanese forces and drive them from American soil, the U.S. military built defense outposts on islands throughout the refuge. After World War II, and up until the end of the Cold War, U.S. military bases continued to be maintained on the refuge. On Amchitka, during the Cold War of the 1960s and 70s, atomic bombs were detonated underground as tests. Today, 
there is only a small military presence on the islands. But the legacy of war has an ecological impact in spite of ongoing cleanup efforts. The after effects, PCBs, oil, fuel, nuclear waste, and unexploded ammunition are still a concern on the refuge. As is the invasion of rats, which first arrived on shipwrecked Japanese vessels over two centuries ago. Later, military ships spread rats to more islands, where they now prey on seabird eggs and chicks and destroy habitat. Rats are vicious predators and they will eat birds, they will eat bird eggs. They pretty much destroyed the seabird colonies on the islands they were introduced to and they probably had a tremendous impact on the nesting lands birds as well. To eliminate rats, the, the first thing we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to prevent the introduction of rats to new islands, to islands where they haven't already gotten to. We are looking at the possibility of removing rats from Rat Island, the island that got rats back in 1780. And we expect if we could do that, that we would get a substantial uh, recovery of many seabird species and uh, land birds. Non-native foxes, along with rats, are continuing threats to birds. On the treeless tundra of the Aleutian Islands, nesting birds evolved without land predators and have developed no natural defenses against them. When foxes were brought to the islands, they devastated bird populations. Since 1949, we've been eradicating foxes on one or more islands a year. The objectives are to eradicate all of the foxes and restore the islands to natural biodiversity. This is a program that's a part of a much larger worldwide effort. There has been a lot of interest in removing invasive species from islands where they occur and restoring islands back to their native habitat. Aleutian Canada geese were believed to have disappeared the first victim of the foxes. But refuge manager Bob Jones heard accounts of naturalist sightings and in 1963 tracked down a remnant population on Bulldeer Island, where foxes had never been introduced. Dedicated work continued for decades, removing foxes, transplanting geese to islands without foxes, and protecting the birds on their wintering grounds. Finally, the geese are considered recovered. We're here on Chigulik to look for Lucian Canada goose nests. We're conducting surveys of Lucian Canada geese as part of the five-year monitoring program since the goose was delisted from the endangered species list in 2000. Listing on the endangered species list is often a one-way street. A species goes on to the list and never comes off it. The Aleutian Canada goose are a success story and one of the few examples of species formerly on the list that through management actions have been designated fully recovered. The success story of the geese is inspiration to the passionate scientists dedicated to protecting and restoring all the native species in these wild and far-flung lands. I've had the privilege of flying over every island, rock, kelp bed in the entire Aleutian Archipelago during the sea otter surveys. And there just wasn't a day when we were out doing those surveys that we didn't see something that made our mouth fall open and go, wow, look at this. The first time I saw Sirius Point, the auklet colony, hundreds of thousands of auklets swirling around, and that's, that's just a phenomenal scene. Seeing all the different sites of nature, seeing all the different landforms and volcanoes changing, supporting all the scientific work that's been conducted over the years. 
boy, it's been one great adventure. My hope for the refuge for the future is to leave it in a better condition for future generations. When summer ends, the seabirds fly out across the ocean, and the scientists board the Tekla for home. What they learn about the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge and its creatures touches everyone on the planet. For their journey tells of the health of the ocean, ultimately linked with all life on Earth.